Well, thank you for coming this evening. The first thing we've got is a December calendar showing you the dates that we're going to be having Bible studies during the holidays. Uh, we will not be having Bible study on Christmas or Monday and Tuesday after Christmas or on New Year's. We will not have Bible study that Sunday and the Monday after that. But we will start uh, Tuesday night, this, uh, uh, January 3rd. Uh, basically, we're following the school calendar. So when Mr. Weemers, the shop teacher, is on vacation, uh, Mr. Weemers, the Bible teacher, is on vacation. So we won't have class those nights. Uh, we are in Mark chapter 5 this evening. There are a series of four stories, beginning with the storm, and now with the demons, and then with uh, going to be Jairus' daughter, and then in the city of Nazareth, where people are going to be making decisions about Jesus. Jesus is going to be doing some things that are uh, beyond understanding. We already saw the storm, and when the disciples, at the end of the storm, they were afraid. They were not afraid of the storm. Well, they were afraid of the storm, but when they saw Jesus deal with the storm, they were afraid of Jesus. The same thing is going to happen tonight. The man that's got the demons, the legion of demons, uh, people are going to be afraid of him, but they're actually going to be asking Jesus to leave their country because they were afraid. They were afraid of Jesus because they saw what he did and the, and the power that they didn't understand it or they did understand it. We've got to make some connections there. Why, why were they afraid? Uh, was it what they, what they saw, what they didn't understand, what they were afraid his power could do to them? Uh, and then Jairus' daughter is going to be raised from the dead. That's going to cause another decision to be made. And then the people of Nazareth, when he comes back to his hometown, not Capernaum, now he's operating out of Capernaum right now, he's going to go to his hometown. And when they see that, they're going to have to decide, can the carpenter's son be the son of God and do these miracles or is this uh, is just just a carpenter's son that that's something strange we we don't know they got to make a decision so all of these are going to be decisions that are going to be made it appears that again one way of looking at this Jesus is going a, across the Sea of Galilee here's the Sea of Galilee something like this uh, he's in Capernaum or he was in the water to speak to the people outside of Capernaum or in that general area he's going to be going across th to this area right here now we're going to talk about where this is located there's several interesting things about this um, but the storm takes place here and when he gets here he's going to be met by a man with a legion of demons who's coming after jesus this may indicate possibly that jesus says i want to go here and he's going into an area called decapolis the 10 cities in fact decapolis means 10 cities uh that were they're, they're uh, Gentile cities. They are cities that were occupied by the Jew, Jews up until during the Hasmonean time. They lost them in 63 B.C. They lost this territory and these cities to Pompey, the Roman general. And they continued to be Greek cities under Roman occupation, under Roman protection, uh, under the governor of Syria is overlooking these cities at this time. So there are 10 Gentile cities that used to be Jewish territory and Jesus is going into this area. It could be, at least it, it, it's worth looking at, that the storm may have been an attempt to prevent Jesus from going over here, and Jesus is met not by a delegation, not by uh, the local you know, uh, you know, lunch department or something. Uh, he's met by a legion of demons trying to scare him and actually calling him by name. And one of the things uh, it, that is believed at this time is that if you knew the name of a demon, you had authority or power over the demon. And it's interesting as we see this, the first thing the demon does or the demons do is they start calling him by name. We know who you are. We know your name. And it's like, and Jesus doesn't flinch. He ends up asking them, what is your name? And uh, they, they're taken into submission. Uh, and we will talk about that. But they may, this may be an attempt to keep Jesus and his message out of Gentile territory. And also notice he's going into Gentile territory right here. We're not sure how many, how many Jewish a uh, act activities going on here, uh, if there's any Jews living there. That's not detailed in the story, but historically this is a Gentile city, or Gentile territory. And also interesting, at the end of the story, the man that the demons are, are cast out of Oh, asked if he can follow Jesus, if he can be with Jesus. Basically asked to be a disciple, and Jesus says, no, go back to your country and tell them. Now, if you know us all the way up until Mark, we've mentioned the, uh, the Messiah secret. 
uh, don't say anything, don't tell anybody, uh, just keep this under wraps. And people that began to proclaim it always caused commotion because, again, there is a, a uh, talking point, if you would, there's an understanding of what the Messiah is going to do in Jewish theology at this time. He's going to set up an army, going to overthrow the Romans, they're looking for the Messiah. And so Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not going to do what they expect the Messiah to do. So to be identified as the Messiah would identify his occupation or his career. That's not what he's going to do. So it's like keeping things under wrap is in the Jewish territory. But interesting now, for the first time, he tells someone, go tell everybody. And it's like, why is this taking place? Well, we don't know exactly what why it is, but it could be he's going into Gentile territory and there's no Messiah expectations. They don't have any preconceived idea he's going with the message to the gentiles of, of what great things the lord has done and so they'll hear it in that sense without all the baggage of the political arena in the jewish community also notice the first per this is the first man sent by jesus in a, in a sense uh, to preach or as a missionary or sent with the message and he's a gentile sent to gentiles and that's just kind of an interesting thing that Mark has here. And again, it's not laid out. Some of those things we're assuming that he, this is all Gentile activity. Now let's read the story. And then we've got to, uh, one of the big hurdles is, uh, if we're going to read the Bible, is uh, right away, where does this thing take, take place? Uh, and the, and what it says right here in the NIV, it says it in your Bibles <coughs> also, but there's several problems with this location. Uh, and, and it's like we're not gonna we're not going to just say well it was a mistake it was a, a made up story that wasn't real uh, but we we also believe I am understand and, and embrace the concept of a scriptural inerrancy that the Bible is without error but that doesn't mean uh, that there haven't been mistakes made as it's been handed down uh, even you can see misspellings and throughout history so there's been mistakes. Uh, and this may be one of those, again, when we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about inerrancy in the original manuscripts. When they were written by Paul or written by Mark under the anointing of the Spirit, they were accurate, they were without error. But surely, soon as the book arrived, say the letter to the Laodiceans arrived, and the Colossians got their letter. They were just sent, send your letter up to the Laodicea. They're going to send their letter down. And they started making copies. Surely someone made a copy mistake. And that's why you have all these manuscripts and, and textual criticism of comparing what it was the original manuscript. What, what did it say? And we may have a problem here that critics, skeptics would say, ah, oh, see, it's all falling apart. Well, we also have understanding that we, we believe in the uh, anointing of the Spirit. We believe in the inerrancy of Scripture in the original manuscripts. But we also realize that they've been copied uh, by hand for many years and throughout history. And this may be something, and, and again, we don't know, I don't know the exact answer to it, but we do have uh, s some pretty clear indications on where to come down with this. But here we go. Uh, it's just the location that I'm talking about. Okay. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, meaning it had been a progression anymore. They'd, they'd bind him for a while, but he kept getting stronger and stronger. They couldn't bind him anymore, not even with a chain. So the different ways of binding him and controlling him had progressed as his strength had grown, which is interesting. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet, which is amazing. No one was strong, you know, even, uh, even of the human body, without breaking bones would be able to do that. You, usually the bones would break. Uh, no one was strong enough to subdue him. And again, this is building up the storyline. Jesus is going to subdue him just with his authority, which is, again, the point of the story. Jesus' mere presence and authority changes everything. Uh, no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, again, notice this distance. 
he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And that falling on his knees in front is, uh, a, 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 the, in the Greek, it's a sign of honor, sign of worship. It's a sign of submission. It, it even involves, and we'll get into this as we go through the notes, it could involve, the word invo- could involve kissing the feet, kissing the hem of the garment. I mean, he's, he's not just falling down, he's paying homage to him. And it to, to, he's going to say two levels of speech right here. Actually, three, if you want to say his, he's, they're going to use his name. Fell on his knees in front of Jesus. He shouted at the top of his voice. He's not speaking. He's hollering at the top of his voice. What do you want with me, Jesus? He says his name. Now, no one introduced them, but he knows his name. And he knows his position, son of the most high God. Now, that is that is equivalent to us saying son of God, but that is the Gentile phrase, son of the most high God. There were many gods. They recognized many gods, and indeed there are many little g gods, rulers and authorities, in, especially among the pagans. This is the most high God. This was the God that was recognized as being above all of the other gods. It was the Jewish God. And so that would match Yahweh of the Old Testament. So, son of the Most High God, and remember even Melchizedek and Abraham were talking about uh, the Most High God. Melchizedek worshipped the Most, he, he wasn't an idol worshiper, he worshipped the Most High God, which was Yahweh, which was Abraham's God, so they were worshipping the same God, just had different names for the same God. Anyway, this is the son of the Most High God, and that's in Gentile terms. And they swear to God, in other words, take an oath to God that you won't torture me. Meaning they're calling on God to have some kind of authority and some, they're claiming some kind of position under God. You know, we want an oath that you, before God, won't torture us. Uh, and notice again, they're, they're appealing to God for their own benefit. It, it, that is very interesting. They're, they're appealing to God for protection from Jesus the son of the most high God. So they're, in, they're already entering into negotiations with Jesus, appealing to God most high to protect them from what Jesus could do to them. And what he could do to them is torture them. Some kind of torture, some kind of torment. And that's, that's expected. That's almost like the expected result of this conflict they've got. We know we're going to end up in, on the wrong end of the deal. We just don't want it to happen already. And they realize Jesus has the authority and the right to do this. Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. So what we've got taking place right here, we've got this conversation goes back and forth. You hear what the demon was saying, but you also hear what Jesus says to the demon. And we're looking at that phrasing right there. Uh, Jesus had been saying to him, as the man was hollering out, Jesus was saying, come out of him. We're done here. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? Uh, again, like, so that doesn't mean that the man, you know, when Jesus says, come out of him, that he didn't come out. It's like the, there's this conversation going on, and Jesus eventually tells him to come out. But we'll talk about that. When Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. He doesn't have a demon. He doesn't have two demons. He's got many demons. The number would be right around 5,000. We'll look at that also. 5,000, that again, doesn't necessarily mean he's got 5,000 demons, but it's large like a legion, which is a division, largest division of Roman troops. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. They want to stay where they're at. They're in their their location they're in their power base that's why they got so much power that's why maybe the demons are continuing to grow in this remember they they were no longer could bind the man there appears to have been a time they could bind him but he kept getting powerful and stronger and it appears the demons are just gathering more and more they've got a a, a, a base of operation and they didn't want to leave the area decapolis the the pagan area a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside now, as we've gone through this story, one of the things that's going to come up in the notes is throughout this whole story, this is recorded in Matthew and Luke also, but in a condensed, not as many details. It's accurate, it lines up with, it's the same story. It's just this account 
has more details, which gives us the idea, again, of an eyewitness. You can tell the story. You know, you can, ta- t- you can hear someone tell a story and then recount the story, but you're going to leave out the details because they're not in your eyes. They're not in your memory. You're just recounting the story. This, again, matches the idea that this is Peter's account that Mark is recording. So Peter was watching all these things take place. So, again, that's maybe why you see a little more detail in here and that throughout the, throughout the book. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the, on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus. Notice, they're negotiating, and Jesus is negotiating with them. So this matches Old Testament, uh, the ideal of the council of the gods, and Jesus, or God talking with the angels, both the fallen and the righteous. Uh, it's just amazing to us that these two people are not, you know, they're not like in isolation, not talking to each other, these two groups. There is this communication, the negotiation that's taking place. Uh, the, the Lord is overall, he sits above the assembly of the gods, it says in Psalms. And here's just an example. He, Jesus would be that God that's sitting in the assembly ab- above all the gods, especially now. He's ahead of the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Uh, and here's the same thing. Uh, the demons beg Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. So they know he, they've got to leave this man, but they say, well, we have an option. Could we go over here? Now, this is, creates another story that uh, I'll give you some ideas, but I, we do not know why this is taking place. That's, see, this is just strange enough where it's like, where's, where's your example? Where's your verses to explain this? This is beyond what we've seen. This is beyond... It's, I don't want to say confusing, but it is challenging to us. Imagine what was happening for those that were watching it take place. Meaning, this is, this is revelation or information or events that are taking place because Jesus, the Son of God, is here revealing himself. The demons are revealing themselves to counter him, and things are happening that we've never seen this before. Uh, he gave them permission, see, permission. And, the, and again, he didn't cast them in. He gave them, they begged, and he's granted their request. They're, in a sense, praying. They're, in a sense, asking for something, and Jesus is giving it to them. He's not saying, Abs, you ask me, I'll just do the opposite. It's like, hmm, that will work. And he grants them permission, which should scare us. It scared the people. They saw him give permission and it all happened. And he, he was like in charge. He's talking to the demon. The demons are begging him permission. He gives them permission. And he allows the demons to well, destroy these herd, this herd of pigs. And it's like, and Jesus doesn't miss a beat. It's like, yeah, he's, that, that's, he's been doing that for, since the beginning of time. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000, which is a large herd, in number, rush down, watch this, rush down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So it's not necessarily that they're jumping off a cliff, but there was a cliff or steep bank involved, and they ran down the steep bank which, and then into the water. So again, you've got the idea of them coming off and just diving in, doing like a Peter Pan into the water, or they're coming down a steep bank and rushing like a, a, a stampede, across the shore into the water again you can can picture either way of reading that Um, but it says rush down the deep bank into the lake so they're rushing down the bank in i think other accounts are ways of looking at they're running off and jumping in or diving off the steep bank and remember the sea of galilee rises and falls i mean not like during the story but there's, when it's full, well, just like we talked, last, was it last week, we talked about the boat, that the water receded, and they could see the boat from 2,000 years ago that they saw, but it had been underwater, but the, wa- they'd never had, the water had not been in a drought like that, that, that they'd been able to find that boat. Well, then water would rise up, and sometimes the coastline would expand. And so sometimes, even when we look at the, the uh, ge- geographical locations of certain cities, it's like, th- I thought that was on the coast of the Sea of Galilee, and now it's in like a mile away because the, the, it, it shifts in the water, you know, the coastline changes, especially over 2,000 years. So uh, again, keep that in mind. Uh, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town a- and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. I mean, they went out and they probably saw, like, dead pigs, 2,000 pigs floating in the Sea of Galilee or washing up on the shore. 
And when they saw the, you know, the sh- pigs washing up on shore, uh, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So they know this man is crazy, and they know the you know, demons. Well, they know the demons came out into these 2,000 pigs that are now washing up on the shore. And here's the man that had the demons just sitting there in his right mind, fully clothed, intelligent, interacting like a human with Jesus. And it's like, I mean, just, I mean you, 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 know, you think at first, oh, wouldn't that be so cool to be there and then worship Jesus and we'd probably sing the Alleluia chorus or something. It'd be, so, it'd be like, yeah, just think, it'd be spooky. It'd be like, oh my gosh, this is, this is weird. You know, you've, you've been in situations maybe just being, you know, at, uh, Tony was gone the last couple of days. I was at home at night by myself and I could hear sounds, you know. It's like, I'm uh, just getting spooky, you know. It's like, like when Tony's here, I'm not scared because Tony's here. But when I'm alone in the house, it's like, Oh, what's happening? <laughs> well, you know, you know that you know that feeling of where the you know that the hair stands up on your neck. And you get like shivers, like uh, 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 that's what it was. They were like in awe of the glory of God. They're like spooked. It's like this is spooky. We've got floating pigs. We've got the demons have. Uh, Jesus is just like all he does talk to them, and it's like this is this like it's like a scary scary movie. That, I mean, at least that's the way, you know, you would think it'd be like, oh, it's like a Christian novel. <laughs> no, it's like a horror show. Uh, again, I'm paraphrasing here, trying to get the, the concept here. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. So everyone's taught because it, it happened publicly and, and with a large group of people. I mean, we've got... The demon-possessed man is not standing amongst the pigs. The pigs are some distance away that are being herded by men watching them. And you've got the demon-possessed man who apparently came out of uh, some tombs or has been around. They know who he is. And so you've got a lot of people that are all kind of coming together going, what did you see? What did you see? They told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. That is not what you would expect when Jesus shows up in your town, is please, that was too weird, that's too spooky, that's power we don't know anything about, you, will you please leave us alone? Because with that kind of power, what could he do? Or are they concerned with their sin, their lifestyles? It's like, what kind of changes is he going to require? I mean, it doesn't say why. I mean, you're, you're open to think, why would they not want him there? One, they're spooked. I mean, they're scared. Two, it's like he's got power. I mean, he just tells things what to do. What could he could just take over the country? He could just, it's like, please go somewhere else and conquer. It's just like pleading with Alexander the Great, go conquer somewhere else. Don't conquer our land. Or it could be, you know, more of light and darkness. We want to live in darkness. We love darkness, not the light. Uh, is that the issue? Nonetheless, they plead with him to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, now notice he does. It's like, just stop by. <laughs> I'm just, I just sailed across the sea, and I'm getting back in the boat. I mean, he doesn't go anywhere. He, he comes to shore, casts out the legion of demons, and gets back in the boat. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them. Now, that's the first time you hear that in Mark how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, and that means the 10 cities, that's, that's a large, I'll show you the, their area, how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Now that could be, uh, there may have been converts or it may have been just the planting of seed and, and spreading of the knowledge. This is a man that has done these things and there's going to be obviously going to be a follow-up. If someone's going to follow up, if it be the disciples, if it be Jesus, if it be travelers, they're going to hear, they're, they're right there. They're going to hear the message. Uh, now, a couple things here. The very first line of, of, the, of chapter 5, verse 1, then they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. The Gerasenes. Now, here's, here's uh, a map again. I hope this doesn't like 
bore you or lose you. Uh, there's Galilee, Capernaum. Jesus is sailing across. I'm going to say, I think my conclusion is this event takes place right here. Uh, now, there is another location over here. And there's another location right here. And we've got this location right here. Now, on the, the, in the Bible, on the top of page 1, uh, Matthew writes, when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadar Gadareans, two demonics coming out of the tombs met him. So there you've got two and the Gadarenes. Mark says they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. The same thing Luke says. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. See, this is... See, this is the Sea of Galilee, but also realize this is the Sea of Tiberias. Also, the Sea of Tiberias is right here. So this is Tiberias, the sea, or this is Tiberias, the city. This is the Sea of Galilee, but this is the land of Galilee. So this would be, he came to this land, which is opposite Galilee. So, I mean, are you talking about the Sea of Galilee or the territory of Galilee? Um, first four bullet points, there are three variants for each gospel. This is a conflict that is a problem. And if the skeptics want to flush the Bible right here, they see, it doesn't even make any sense, can't even agree. Okay, you go ahead. If that's what's going to sink your ship and you can't have faith anymore, then, well, you never had faith. Uh, but if you want a logical conclusion, or at least some options, uh, we have uh, some things to look at. If Mark is correct, uh, Luke follows Mark, if whoever was written first, the pigs are in hills with a steep bank that falls into the Sea of Galilee, within running distance, stampeding distance of this location. This is not a 37-mile run. This location that Matthew refers to is right here. This is 37 miles away. This location is five to six miles away. What I think happened was this site was the original site right here. We'll talk about it. It, it was old, it was ancient, and it got lost in time and it was in the text, but to make more sense of it, not Matthew, not Luke, not Mark, they're all in, someone changed this to refer to this country right here, because that, that, that's on the other side. They went over to this side. Then as time goes on, 37 miles, uh, pigs are running 37 miles to dive in. It's like, no, y they, th they made a textual correction. You must have meant this location. Well, this was wrong. This was the wrong correction because this site was lost. Now, here's your choices right here. Uh, first of all, let's, let's see, uh, look and see if I get a map here. Yes, go to page two. There's a map. Let's get some names on here. This is Gergesa. <coughs> Gergesa, I spelled that right. This is G-A-D-A-R-A. -A. So that's the city of Gadara. It's also a city today. Uh, and you see like the G G Gadarenes. You know, you, you see Gergesha, the G Gergesenes. Uh, and this is Garessa. G-A-R-A-S-A. -A. Now, I, I, I apologize. I'm sure people would be thinking, it's like, oh, th who even cares? Well, that's the problem with me being a Bible teacher. I care, and so you're going to have to put up with it. Because it's like, okay, this is odd. And someone's going to ask me a question someday, and I'll go like, hmm, I should have looked into that. Uh, plus, that's what I want to do. So Geressa, right here, is one of the cities in Decapolis. It is the capital of the country of the Gerasenes. It is 37 miles from the Sea of Galilee. It is today the city of Jeresh, Jeresh in Jordan. The country of the Gerasenes did not reach the Sea of Galilee. So the borders of this land right here don't reach this. So that's, that's what Matthew says. That's your text in Matthew. The text is going to say it was this place right here. Um. Or excuse me, M Mark and Luke is going to refer to that. 
uh, Matthew, someone in Matthew is going to switch it to Gadara. That's the next bullet point. It's Um Kesa, however, Kais, Kis, Um Kis, however you say that, five to six miles from the Sea of Galilee right here. Some say Matthew was aware of this problem in Mark and Luke, so he changed the country of the Gerasenes to the country of the Gadarenes right here. Now, Joseph, Josephus says the village of the Gadarenes, Gadara, so Josephus refers to this, happened to lie on the frontier between Tiberias and the territory of Scythopolitans. Now, Tiberias is here. That other city is on the west side. This is the only, only one of the ten cities of the Decapolis that's on the west side, and that is the city of uh, Cy- Cythropolitans. Uh, and so this city is identified accurately by, by Josephus. And then there is the city of Gergesha. Gergesha, right here. Uh, or Kersi, or Kursa, is among the cliffs that overlook the Sea of Galilee near the Wadi Shamak. There's a Wadi, a little river, dry river, that drains into the Sea of Galilee right there. Now we've got maps to look at here on the next page. Um, the word Shamak means fish, or the Valley of Kersi. It has fertile farmland with grazing areas. This site was lost to history, except it's referred to by Origen in the in the in like two hundreds, and then again by Eusebius, but no one knows where the city's at. Until 1970s, they're bulldozing a road through this area right here, and they uncover a Byzantine basilica. So you're going to have a reference to this place around in the 200s by origin is going to identify this place, and no one knows where it's at. Eusebius is going to pick up on that around, let's just say, 350. And in the 400s, when uh, the Roman Empire is now Christian, the, the Byzantine Empire, they're going to build a huge basilica right here, and they're going to go up on, w- down by the, where the, the city was, and they're going to go up on the tell, the high place of the city that drops off like a cliff, and they're going to build a chapel, a, a church there on that hill. They began, they didn't r- realize anything was really there until they hit it with a bulldozer, and they began to find Byzantine pottery. So, okay, stop, like in Israel, like always, they're bulldozing, and all of a sudden, wait, stop. We just found an ancient site. Well, of course you did. People lived here for 6,000 years or more. And so they started, okay, now they got got to put the road go around they got to save the place and now it's a it's a a place that you can visit and see but they discovered it and it matched uh what origin was talking about it matched what eusebius did and now you've got archaeology things being built right here uh because this was the site that they had thought in 200 350 400 was the site of this event that place was lost they got moved, the name got switched to here because it was similar. That was too far away. So Matthew, whoever's te- writing or copying Matthew says, can't be that, must be this, at least it's closer. But they are both wrong. Now again, th- th- I don't know if that's for sure. That, that's, that's putting the pieces of the, of the mystery together. Um, it w- has a large walled settlement with a monastery. Halfway up the steep slope is a tower-like structure excavated in 1980 that appears to be the site of the herd of the pigs leaping or going down the embankment. It is marked with a structure from the 200s. There's a structure there up on this hill from the 200s. So what Origen talks about, they'd already built a little structure on top of there, so recognizing that was the place that this took place. Uh, the Hebrew word, f- uh, okay, let's see, or, okay, Origen writes, uh, in, he lived between 185 and 253, he writes, but Gergesa, or Gergesa, from which comes the name, the Gergesenes, is an ancient city in the vicinity of the lake, which is now called Tiberias, the Sea of Tiberias, or the Lake of Tiberias. There is a cliff, Origen writes, lying beside the lake from which they point out the swine were cast down by the demons eusebius apparently picking up on what origin had written eusebius writing okay i said 350 it'd be 
260 to 313, writes, Gergesa, there the Lord healed the demonics. Now a village is pointed out beside Lake Tiberias into which the swine rush down headlong. And now we're going to go through some maps, but what we have right here, for your entertainment pleasure, that is the hill, a part of the ancient city. Some of this stuff was built in the 200s, a chapel uh, uh, recognizing, or a pillar and a chapel recognizing the place. Here we go. Let's see what happens. See if I got this. There, looking from that place, you're looking down through the fields. I'm standing right on top of that, right on top of that embankment there, that ancient tell. That there's the Sea of Galilee. This would be where Jesus would have landed, potentially. There, we're looking up at it again. Uh, there, of course, I'm standing there by one of the pillars, by one of the chapels that was built in the 200s or the Byzantine time period. There's some of the mosaic floors, b- clearly Byzantine. There's the pillar near the site that's up on the hill there. Uh, there's more of the floor. Now I'm looking from that high spot. I'm looking down. Sea of Galilee would be in front of me. I'm looking down the embankment. Looking this way, there's the, uh, a basilica, see? There's a basilica over there from the from the 400s there it is now here i'm looking from from the basilica i'm looking up see that this is the embankment that they would have ran down into the plain of the sea this is a basilica there for honoring this place had four entrances this is the front one this would be destroyed by the persians uh, when they destroyed all the churches around oh 600 a.d they came through and destroyed they didn't destroy the church of the nativity that was still original because it had pictures of persians on the wall put there by the early artists of the of the constantine's time so they they were still there today they had they had uh wise men looking dressed like persians and so when they came in to burn down this church they said wait 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 <laughs> that's us <laughs> and they they spared the church so we can still see the floor and all the things that from that's in bethlehem but this would have been destroyed um that's the baptismal there's the floor that's the mosaic floor there. That's again looking at the Byzantine uh, Basilica. And now we're looking back up at that hill right there. And that's where, again, now if you look on page two, there you've got the place. I've got them underlined. Gergesha with the arrow pointing towards it where the Jesus would have landed. That was this place right here. Uh, then right down there s- south of there, Gadara. That's five to six miles from the Sea of Galilee. And then Garessa, out here, 37 miles, and that's your places. Now, the next picture shows you uh, the Tel Kersi on the left there. You can see the little circles showing topography of it rising. That's the Tel there. There was a, a man-made, uh, 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 sh- what do you call it, what do you call it, basin, uh, golf, shore, what's that called? Uh, bay, harbor is what I'm trying to think of, yeah. Uh, that those ma- just like Herod built a, out by Caesarea by the maritime, they built that there. That can, that can be found the fish market. There's a synagogue. Those are some things they found right along that coast, right here where Jesus would have landed if that was the location. Uh, here's again the next map. Show I took that off Google Earth right there, showing you the the places right there. It's where Jesus would have landed. Uh, there's a picture of the uh, of the uh, basilica that was down on the ground there. It's all the details. They're re- redrawn it archaeologically. And here's the pictures right here. I showed you this. There's the basilica. There we're looking up at the hill where the pigs would have been. Uh, that's the next picture on page five is where they would have ran across. There, of course, I can't put pictures up without putting a picture of myself saying, look, I was there. And then here in the page six is basically four maps, basically the same thing. And what you've got here is uh, on the first map, you've got the territories and the 10 cities. Look, way up at the top left, you can see Damascus is one of the de- cities of the Decapolis. Then below that is uh, Canatha, and then Dion, and then you're going over towards Gadara, which is right there where Jesus would land. Right north of that is the land of Hippos, or the city of Hippos, the Sea of Galilee. And those are your, and notice uh, uh, across the sea at Scyth- Scythopolis, is on the west side. The others are all over on the east side. Those are the Decapolis. When it says the man went to the Decapolis, those are the places he went to. 
he went into the Decapolis. Uh, you'd assume he had more traveling done there near the Sea of Galilee, but if you read it literally, he would have covered that whole territory. That's where the, he was overworking with. Uh, and then those other maps, I try to circle Gad Gergesha, Gadara, and Garissa over there on all three, all, all three of those locations on those maps. So there you have it right there. Uh, again, that's an introduction. Chapter 5, verse 1, where is this at? I think it's right here. I think it's right here. Now, as we go on, if we look on page 7, I'm going to give you a little more information on this site right here. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea. We know they started in Capernaum. We know they're sailing this way to the other side. Uh, the storm took place somewhere like in here. They landed, or if the sh uh, storm took place, you know, late in the evening, maybe even early in the morning, they would have arrived, you know, early in the morning, you know, as uh, during the day, they would have arrived. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes, and there it would, that would match the name right there, coming out of here, if they try to replace that, and that sh would probably match that. Uh, Mark may have meant the area associated with the Gerasenes, of which the city of Garissa was part of that territory. I, you know, that's the city within that territory. Different ways of trying to explain it. Uh, the name here in other texts includes the following, and none is more superior than the other. Other, other texts, like different manuscripts, will say, they came to the country of Gerasa. They came to the, er the country of Gadara. They came to the country of Gergesa. So though all three of those are in different manuscripts, and now you've got this pile of manuscripts, and they're all saying three different locations. So now you try and find which is the earliest one, and you can't determine that, which is the majority that's all balanced. And so it's really just hanging there that people were struggling throughout church history as they translate, wh wh where's this place at? And again, that's why we've got a 200 witness of origin, 350 Eusebius. Then you got all the Byzantine activity there. Now that doesn't match everything perfectly because that, that hill uh, that I was showing you that I was standing on where the church is built, that was really the tell of the city. That was the Acropolis. That's where the high part of the city was. Then the city would have spread out from there. So they're not going to have 2,000 pigs up there in the city. Plus they're grazing. And so... And there's a, a crazy man, demon of this, coming out of the tombs. And so some of this helps right here. Uh, the site, he, commentaries even say it, most likely is Gergesa, also called Kersi. This Gergesa was in the administrative district of Hippos. You can see that on the maps. It appears that Gergesa became unknown. The text was altered to a well-known Gerasenes. But the great distance of Gerasa, 37 miles from the sea, encouraged the text adjustment to the Gadarenes modern umkis, whatever, uh, which is only six miles from the sea, which is still wrong. 1970, a bulldozer found this place. In the 200s, both archaeology and church tradition indicate this was known as the site of Mark 5. So you've got archaeology confirming it, and you've got church history origin writing this is the place in 200 AD, which is a good testimony. Uh, about one, now watch this, about one mile south of this place right here, now, you could think that the pigs, that they came right off that cliff there. That's what I like to think because that's where I was standing. But that's more like saying, now, but you go a mile from there, south, there's a ridge that extends almost to the sea, uh, about 40 yards from the sea, and ends in a steep drop off into the sea. So if you just go, just like we can see, this looks like, I showed you this picture from here, looking right down, you can see right down here, it drops off, and then it's just flat right into the sea. Well, you go about a mile from there, you've got a similar setting, and it drops off, and it got about 40 yards to the sea. So th that would take place. And there's grazing fields around there. Uh, so I think we're close. This could match the location of the event. And then a mile from there, a mile from here, you've got another ridge with a drop-off into the Sea of Galilee. And a mile from there, you've got a, a, a cave tombs that had previously been used as dwelling places. So... One, two miles from here, you've got the tombs. A, a mile from here, you've got a cliff just like this. And this would be the city where the man would have been. Ho however, it's fitting into this, this two-mile stretch right here of tombs, another ridge with a drop-off into the sea, or this very location right here. And so that would be the area of Gergesa. Again, that's, that's what we know. Um, this is Gentile territory. Decapolis literally means the ten cities. 
I told you the Hasmoneans lost it to the uh, Roman Pompey, his, the general Pompey in 63. And since that time, Rome has controlled it, but it's Gentile cities under the jurisdiction of the consul in Syria. Now, chapter 5, verse 2, going through the notes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, as soon as he, he lands right here, when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So again, you're going to assume that Jesus is not, his boat's not landing in front of the tombs necessarily, could be, or his boat is not landing, you know, right up where the pigs are feeding. Maybe they're landing here on near this city somehow. But the man from the tomb has come wherever Jesus is at. The man, if Jesus does sail down where the tombs are, he comes out of the tombs. If Jesus sails in more towards the city, where the, it's a very popular city uh, at that time, the man would have moved, made his way up there to meet him. And that's not, that, that's not surprising when you think about the storm may have been caused by demonic activity. Jesus said, peace, that was over. Now this, the demons are trying again to keep him out of this area. And the people even resist him. Um, immediately there met him a man and from the tombs an unclean p- spirit. Uh, point one on p- bottom page seven. This is Jesus' third encounter with demons. But they've, it's been a, a situation with an individual with a demon. And the demons always talk. He says, be quiet. In this case, it's a whole legion of demons. It's the most fierce. Uh, again, I point out mar- point two at the top of page eight. Mark's account has more details than the others, making this a clearly an eyewitness account goes on chapter 5 verse 3 he lived among the tombs this describes the man and no one could bind him anymore not even with a chain for he had often been bound with shackles and chains but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces so he twists the chains and he'd crush the shackles no one had the strength to subdue him so the man was just loose like a wild animal he's just loose and he's he spends the night in the tombs he stays out wanders in the evenings uh, night and day among the tombs and on the mountainside, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Uh, point one on page nine, this, is, uh, this man has four characteristics described by rabbis of a madman with some kind of sickness. He's running around at night, staying in tombs, tearing apart one's clothes or his flesh. He's, he's torn off his clothes, so the only thing he's got to tear now is his flesh. So he's trying to get out of his clothes. Once he's out of his clothes, he's trying to get out of his skin and destroying whatever he has. So those are the four things rabbis would describe. This person is a madman. Uh, They run around at night. They stay in tombs. They tear apart their clothes, tear apart their skin, and they destroy whatever they have. This man fits those characteristics. And when he saw Jesus from afar, that's an interesting word right there, afar. He sees Jesus from a distance. So he's, he's coming from somewhere is he coming from two miles away one mile away from you know the other side of the street i mean so there's some room to work with as you as you try to imagine what this story is looking like i came to jesus from afar he ran and fell down before him so he's not attacking jesus he's not running to attack him he is running to him because he is the opposition But he's running towards because he is the superior opposition and he's running for mercy he's running to get on in front of the up front of the game in front of the problem he realizes this is a problem if you go back the storm tried to stop him now the man is actually on our shore what are we going to do we've got to engage and uh point one the demon like the storm may have been attempting to prevent jesus from coming into his territory well now he's here the Greek verb fell on his knees. You can see it in the Greek text there. Pros, pros kainen denotes prostrating before a person to whom reverence or worship is due. I mean, this guy is not falling down, uh, you know, trying to attack him or he's being blinded by the light. He's falling down in such a way that he is paying homage. He's worshiping. He's recognizing him as a superior. Uh, and notice this man... This man, what this man says, the demonic possessed man, and what he does, his actions are controlled by the demons. So this man who, you know, in his own mind doesn't know who Jesus is, but the demons do, and they cause the man to fall in front of Jesus in a way that is, again, submissive to Jesus, in a way that would pay reverence or worship and i said before it even may include kissing the feet or the hem of the person's garment they are paying worship to jesus recognize him 
what natural men cannot say these you know the disciples again this is revealing that's one of the things that's taking place in all these stories is jesus revealing who he is and now you decide he revealed who he was in the storm and the disciples are like we did not know this now they're going to see this as like we did they're following jesus they're his disciples but we did not know this and they haven't seen him raise someone from the dead nick's account he's going to raise someone from the dead we did not know this it's like he, he, he just keeps going up as far as his ability so jesus is revealing but the disciples don't fully understand obviously the people just in the common crowd don't understand but what's amazing is the demons know all about him they know his name they know he's the son of the most high god uh so i mean it, it's clear to them which is just amazing humans are like in a fog the demons can see it clearly now again we're not giving demons credit for being good ministers or having a you know the word of truth but they do recognize god where men they, they don't know what what it is uh chapter 5 verse 7 and crying out with a loud voice he said what have you to do with me in other words he feels like he's under attack the demons feel like and again if you go back to the storm stop him now he's here what are you doing in my territory they saw they know what's going on over here it, the, demonically and now he's coming across the what are you doing here you've got israel what are you doing in my territory what do you want with me this is what the man is saying but it's the legion speaking what have you to do with me jesus son of the most high god i adjure you by god do not torment me again that very clearly he's using jesus name and if that's some kind of a formula you know like we talk about demonic and, and exorcism they use the name if you can name the demon you could supposedly control the demon so he's naming jesus if nothing else he knows who he is and then he says i adjure you by god he pleads to god for his case and he doesn't want to be tortured and that's in the next points right here point one the demons may have been trying to gain power over jesus by speaking his name uh jesus counters it by saying asking him, what's your name uh adjure point two adjure you is hor horkidzo in the greek it means i adjure you to, to as god i adjure you as god meaning i'm, I'm talking to you like I, you have the ability to do this it sounds like an exorcism formula meaning you're calling on god to do something for you uh, it means to make one swear or to bind an under the obligation of an oath he's trying to put jesus under an oath swear by god before we have any further interaction that you're not going to torture me i'm not going to cooperate unless you take a vow that you're not before god now you can't lie to me that you're not going to torture me that you're not going to torment me now again he knows that is jesus option he knows jesus has that ability he he the demons probably realize if they understand the whole concept this is their ultimate end this is when you rebel against god most high you've got some time to burn but you're going to end up being tortured you're going to end up in torment please not yet not yet you can see one of the demons says you've come before your time in another gospel you've come before your time this is not the end time we still have time on the clock don't send us to the abyss don't torture us we know before god that it's not the right time you're here early this isn't what we signed up for you say hey, hey not a problem <laughs> we've got time on the clock i'm going to use it the demon was pleading that jesus not torment him which is an indication of the understood ultimate result of the conflict with yahweh and a recognition of being under the authority of jesus meaning jesus could at that moment you have the authority I just want you to say you won't use it. Promise you're not going to use the authority you've got. And Son of the Most High God, we've already talked about all that. It's, it's a pagan term for the God that is above all the other gods, which is Yahweh's title. Chapter 5, verse 8, For he was saying to him, notice that in the English Standard, and that's a good, it's either like, uh, it can be translated either, uh, he was repeatedly saying, uh, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So he was saying it repeatedly which would be interesting or he was while the demon was saying these things jesus was saying had already said or was in the process of saying come out of him you unclean spirit so again if you see him uh and i've been in charismatic services and seen some things back in the day and you know they they it's almost like an exorcism exercise and they're they're 
talking and casting and making noise. And it's kind of like it doesn't look like much is getting done here. And that would give Jesus the impression here. In fact, I remember someone preaching on this, that Jesus was saying repeatedly until the guy, the demon broke, that Jesus had to say it over and over and over and over again. And it's like, I don't think that's the point of the story. I think the point of the story is Jesus said, come out and game over. It wasn't like, I got to say it louder. I've got to say it with more. It's like he just said it. So I think the idea there, it could be he's repeating it over and over, or he was saying this statement at this moment while the demon is saying this back at him. This is what Jesus was saying to him. For he was saying, or he, for he was saying to him as the demon was asking him all these things, begging for mercy, if you would, you know, ask him to take an oath, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Uh, and again, point one, the demon is expelled simply by Jesus' authority. He doesn't, you know, burn candles. He doesn't have an incantation. He doesn't swear by God. He just tells him, notice right here, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He calls him, you unclean spirit, and come out. A- a- he doesn't have to say, in the Lord's name. He doesn't have to say, by the name of God. He just says, because he's Jesus, he is God. He just says it, and there's no higher authority. Uh, again, Point two, the, the Greek magical papyri you can f- found in Egypt provides details of, they, they, are, they practice exorcism, but it provides details of the long, complicated formulas and spells and catch words and things that they would say and kind of conjure up some kind of power. It's almost like a, 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 a manipulation game. And Jesus is not even close to that. He just says it. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Now again, this could have been going on before jesus before jesus says what is your name he replied my name is legion for we are many and now we break down legion again we don't know exactly what legion means is that just a name if you lead he says legion and he says because we are many it means there are many does it mean four five ten if you go with the word legion here it is is a military term from the latin legio identifying the largest unit of troops in a roman army simply five thousand troops the Roman legion was commanded by a se- senator of the praetorian rank, so the senator would be the director of that legion, uh, and actually, in technical terms, a Roman legion had 5,400 foot soldiers and 120 horsemen. So this is a well-organized, if this legion is what it says it is, it is a military force, well-organized, well-equipped, and has a purpose and a function. Uh, this man had, a, had, a, had an organized demonic military force living in him. The rulers and authorities of heavenly places were operating in that base right there. This demon-possessed man is more than a split personality, but it would be a multiple personality that has been shattered to a large number equal to or similar to five. It wasn't split, you know, two people. It was like shattered personalities, like ooh, all of these living within him. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Again, why the country? We, we hear him talk about not into the abyss, but we want to stay in our country. We've got something going here in this pagan territory. Now, j- again, Mark writes, now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. So Jesus comes off the shore. If you go back to my picture, there's the shore down here. Jesus, the city's over in this area. Jesus, and again, this is not necessarily accurate, but for example, he's on the shore here. On the hillside, there were pigs grazing, if it be this place. Again, this seems to have had m- more going on there than just the hill. Uh, pigs were feeding on the hillside. 2,000 pigs would be, w- was the number, a large herd. It'd be a business. It'd be some kind of corporation. Of It wasn't just one guy with his pigs. It was a corporation, and they're, they're producing pork they're producing bacon they're there and again this is gentile territory Uh, it is it's occupied by the gentiles but it is jewish territory so now we got to ask the question is going to come up why does jesus allow the pigs to be destroyed why does jesus now he's in a sense taking honoring a request you wonder if god answers your prayers he just is going to answer the prayers of these demons can we go into the pigs it's like yeah go ahead i mean I wish I had my prayers answered that quick. It's like, I mean, meaning, again, the idea there, if, if you communicate with God, he is listening. He's even listening to these demons. He's communicating with them. Again, this is a strange story. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hill, the, there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. 
Now, I know you're here to take up some te- territory. You're going to deliver this guy. But hey, we've got, we'll negotiate. We're willing to go into the pigs. Now, we don't know if the demons drove the pigs into the Sea of Galilee or if the pigs drove the demons into the Sea of Galilee. I mean, it doesn't say that. It just says when they come into the pigs, the pigs, like a, they take off like a stampede. They're grazing. And you ever heard them say, you know, it's like herding cats. I guess right below herding cats would be herding swine. It's like, it's like they're not going to like, they're all just on their own, just doing their own thing. And all of a sudden, they just instantly unify like a military, like a legion of troops, and rush into the Sea of Galilee. And all of a sudden, like, whoa. I mean, to see that takes just a hurt, hurt swine just mulling around. All of a sudden, they're just like snap into military formation and into the Sea of Galilee. Now, did the pigs go there first and take the demons, or did the demons take the pigs? So he gave them permission, chapter 5, verse 13. And the unclean spirits came out of the man, doesn't say this, it came out, and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned it in the sea. So if this would be the place right here, they rushed down the bank, they would have fallen down, and they rushed down this, and just the stampede continued right on in the Sea of Galilee. If it's here, or if it's a mile south, or if it's some other location. This is, again, within the area where it was taking place. Um, Again, uh, the herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. Again, those 2,000 pigs didn't go into the Sea of Galilee and disappear. Uh, They drowned, and then those dead bodies floated up and bloated on the sea. On the coast, they got dead pigs floating all over. It's like, you know, the plagues or something. Uh, Now, the, the question would be, Why would Jesus allow these pigs to be destroyed because it's somebody's business? Uh, The I don't know. I don't want to say the Sunday school answer, but all the lot all the commentaries say, well, it's more important to deliver the man than the pigs. The man is more important than the pigs. Okay, that's okay. That's true. But I mean, but you can deliver the man without destroying the pigs. I mean, it's like it's like Jesus didn't have an option. It's like he's going to have some kind of a prisoner transfer with russia and you've only got this one option you have no other option you've got to kill the pigs to save the man i mean i'm surely he could have delivered the man without killing the pigs uh so i don't i'm not real big on that one although they say you know that the man is more important one of the things would be could be the idea that uh, uh that it was illegal it, it's a m- law of moses uh, even jews were not allowed to you know raise or even sell to the gentiles pork and this could have been a, a bootlegging business. It, it's Decapolis is Gentile cities, but it's still Jewish territory. Just because the Gentiles have taken it doesn't mean that's not Jewish. You know, in God's eyes, it's it's the land of the Jews. So it could be that you know, it's like it's illegal. I don't want these pigs here. Also, swine were offered by the Gentiles, the Greeks, on their altars. In fact, that's what they did. That's how they desecrated the temple. They offered swine and the blood of a, a pig in the, in the temple and desecrated the, the, the altar. And so that was, again, his destroying of the, of the pigs. Uh, I would have no problem thinking that, you know, it's illegal. And I, would, I suggest this also. And I don't see this in any other commentary. So the, it's like one of these things, you, you have an idea and you read commentary after commentary and none of the commentators have your idea. It's like, ooh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking because no one else says it. Uh, but I, th- I, and I've said it before, and I, it makes sense to me, and you can f- feel free to shoot it down, is if these are bootleg pigs, or they're, I- they're not under God's protection, they're, in fact, it's illegal, according to the law of Moses, for them to be there. And so the demons say, they see a loophole. They say, hey, you can protect this man, but you can't protect the, 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 the pigs. Because if you protect the pigs, you're coming against the very law that you established. So, can we go on the pigs? And Jesus, you know, in, you know, if I'm paraphrasing or I'm ab-libbing here, is I can't protect them, so there they are. Which means God has divine protection for us, for you, for people, for situations. But if you go outside of that, it's kind of like there's no, you know, there's no protection. And the pigs would be outside of God's protection. So the, the demons, of course, know the rules. And the law of Moses says no pigs. There's pigs. 
He can't stop us from going to the pigs, so hey, can we go to the pigs? And Jesus gave them permission. Why would he do that? Because if he says no, he's now protecting the pigs, violating the law of Moses himself, violating his own life. We don't want pigs here. And again, we're not talking about Jesus being stuck in the rituals, but this is a clear violation. It's the same thing it is, you know, you're going to rob a bank. God, please bless me while I rob this bank. It's kind of like, well, if God's going to bless you while you rob the bank, now God's, you know, it's like, uh, that's not going to happen. It's just a corny example. But that, I think, would be something about that answer uh, that God, yes, Jesus did destroy the pigs, destroyed the business, and that upsets the people. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and the country, and the people came to so- and s- to see what had happened, and they see the dead pigs, they see the man in his right mind, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, so they came and saw what had happened, the pigs, they came to Jesus to see Jesus, and they see the man, the one who had had the legion sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The dead pigs, the man in his right mind, Jesus himself standing there. Um, and then I write down point two, do they fear his power, do they fear his, him revealing their darkness, do they fear the consequences of not being able to control him? <laughs> Or do they fear what they do not understand? This is just spooky. Uh, It is interesting that the people do not rush to worship him. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And I'm wrapping this up. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Again, Decapolis. As he was getting into the boat, so he does. They begged him, leave. (laughs) All right, I'm out. And he's getting into the boat, and the demon-possessed man, the man who had been possessed with demons, begged him that he might be with him. He begged him, can I be a disciple? Uh, And that's what it indicates. I got it written in the notes. And he did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends and tell them, this is the the point of the story, how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. What is the message? You go tell them what the Lord has done for you. Now notice Jesus refers to himself as the Lord. He doesn't say what Jesus has done, what the Lord has done. The demon says, you're the son of the most high God. Yes, I am the Lord. You go tell them what the Lord has done and how he has had mercy on you. And that is your message because what Jesus wants to do is follow into that Gentile territory. I'm able to do this for you, deliver you from your same paganist activities and also not judge you, but have mercy on you. The message was not, and I can drive you into the ground like these pigs, but it was, forget about the pigs and the demons. Look, the man, I delivered him and had mercy on the man. He didn't have mercy on the demons, didn't have mercy on the pigs. He had mercy on the man. That is your message. Don't look at the pigs. Don't worry about the demons. I can have mercy. Uh, And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled, which is, again, doesn't say they believe, but it is they're paying attention and they're listening. He's on all the talk shows, and it's laying a foundation for what's going to come up next on the next Twitter release, the next time Jesus is in the neighborhood. And it's like, now they're ready for the next step, possibly salvation. And again, you've got to believe that Jesus will be in the area next, t- uh, you know, later on. The disciples will be there. If you notice on the maps, there's a city called Pella right there. That's one of the Decapolis cities there. Uh, the, the, the church of Jerusalem in 70, it'd be 66 AD under Simeon's leadership would be James's cousin, Jesus' cousin, leads them across the, at the Jor- uh, uh, Jericho at the Jordan and leads them up and they spend the Jewish wars there in the city of Pella. The Christian church of the Jews, the Jewish Christians, spend the Jewish revolts in the city of Pella in the Decapolis while Jerusalem's being burned, and of course they're going to spread the gospel at that time, and then they return to Jerusalem and Christianize it and build churches there after the Jewish distru- uh, the, uh, fall of Jerusalem at the hand of the Romans. I'll pray. I appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for listening. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We do ask that we would ourselves seek Jesus, that we would not be intimidated or fearful, but we would honor him, worship him, and allow him to change our lives. We'd come to him in, in, seeking mercy, seeking guidance, And Father, we do ask that you'd open the scriptures up that we might understand these things, that the things that are hidden to us may be made apparent, that we may make correct connections and applications in our own lives. We do thank you again for this and ask that we may walk in power and in strength and in wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being here.